Um, and in this sort of crazy January festival season, we wanted to really have some time to uh, just create context for the work and have opportunities for the artists to engage in dialogue with each other and with the audience so that there's just, you know, more of a circularity um, and a dialogue going on. And so this is where the partnership uh, with Pajabat uh, uh, got created. And so we're very happy that you're here for the conversation. We are also streaming on HowlRound, so any comment, any if you are asking questions, just know that it's out there to the public. Hello. Um, and uh, just I want to introduce you, uh, my friend Andy Corwitz, who um, has, uh, since those five, six years ago, uh, relocated to the West Coast, but uh, very proud um, of him because he just accepted a position as the director of programs at the Skirball Computer Center in Los Angeles. <laughs> So uh, I'll just stand up over. Um, uh, just really quick before we, we jump into it. So I, um, uh, 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 Culture Bot is, is, exists because of Mark Russell. Um, I was working at PS122 in 2002 and 2003, and he kind of said, oh, it sounds good, do it. <laughs> um, and we wrote an NPN grant, and that was how the whole thing started. And um, so I'm. The reason I'm saying that is because when I moved to the West Coast, I was like, how, I, what does this mean? Um, and so one of the things I learned from Mark was learning how to give the next group of people uh, an opportunity to do their thing um, and make things their own. So um, as I've stepped away from CultureBot, I want to introduce uh, right there, we've got Dan, Sarah, and Lydia. Um, pies, and um, they're and and they're the they're the sort of new core culture bot team. They've been holding on the fort for about the past year and a half. And familiar, I meet them, say hi, get involved. They've opened up the range of people writing and events. It's really exciting. So, um, and then also at the end of this um, is Eva Peskin. Eva has been um, a, a great partner in organizing and thinking about these conversations and. Um, I'm actually going to sort of, uh, I've asked Eva to kind of take the lead on this. I'm going to be here. I, I usually can't restrain, my, restrain myself from talking, but, but uh, so anyway, thank you all for being here and find the new culture about people and uh, yeah, and Eva, thank take you, it away. Thank you, Andy, thank you. Um, so yesterday we were talking about strong energy of media. And so this talk today is kind of cheekily titled Destroyer of Worlds, which Andy told me is his mind from what Robert Oppenheimer said after the Manhattan Project, the idea that he destroyed the world, and it also comes from the idea of Shiva as the destroyer of worlds. I, I, I have become death, destroyer of worlds. Right. And so we're thinking about theater and its capacity to destroy the world, to change the world. Um, through this defamiliarization. And so to start, I would love to just hear how that concept resonates for you all in your work, this idea that um, you defamiliarize something in theater to be able to see it differently. Does, that make sense? does anyone, does that make anyone call to speak? structure with which to actually make and show the work that is it theater is it dance is it performance 
who pushes you into, obviously these are structures that are built for um, funding and presentation and marketing, but they are also the space where things can exist and overlap a form um, is sort of complicated, so maybe that's one way in which worlds should ought be destroyed. Um, and I also think we tend to work with bodies of performers and, and performers who are not typically, who are not always seen on stage, and we ask them to behave in ways that are perhaps not um, according to a scripture of virtuosity that is, uh, is experienced often, or it's just a different code of virtuos virtuosic rules. I mean, initially when I hear the term destroy of worlds, what I think of immediately is how much destruction and violence it took to get us to the point where we are right now, right? Uh, how much blood there is uh, in the land that we are like sitting on, uh, how much we inherit, and it's this legacy of ongoing and continual violence, right? Um, and for me, the idea of journalism, like the profession of journalism, uh, has always been a really weird one to talk about the experiences, especially under colonialism and capitalism of a uh, community that I align myself with, right? Um, because the idea of journalism relies on the idea of news and novelty um, and of objectivity. Uh, I don't think any of that exists. Uh, I think what theater allows us to do is to destroy all those concepts, throw them out, right? Um, say all of this is ongoing, it has never stopped. Um, it's been here since forever. Um, it's been here, like in the United States in particular, right, since 1492. Uh, we have had resistance on the basis of race, gender, and sexuality. Um, it's not some sort of newfangled thing, um, or a trans tipping point, or whatever these terms that uh, the media comes up with to describe uh, particular moments that we're in. Um, I think of things in cycles and nonlinearity and emotion and feelings uh, and trauma, right? In, in a, and I think that theater and art and poetry uh, ultimately are all just different attempts to scream in a way that journalism and news and all these whatever other apparatuses don't allow us to. Um, it's a space to say something uh, loudly <laughs> or to whisper it or sing it, um, something that is totally irrational and illogical, right? uh, something that actually should not be expressed in a way that is boring. Um, I, I, yeah, I, like, if there's anything that I wanna do uh, with my work, it's to like destroy boring. Uh, because if any, like boring is so violent, it makes it seem like the world is like doing fine. Um, and it's just not true. This has, has never not been true for millennia. Um, so I just want to make things that are like beautiful and interesting and honestly like so beautiful that it destroys someone's world, right? That's the goal. It's like I want to make it so beautiful they can't look away and they have to listen and then a moment of crisis happens and that's where you open people up and whatever, have a conversation, uh, initiate moments just to add, I feel art is one of the only places we have left to scream. Uh, people go to the university to scream, and it becomes an incoherent dissertation. Could you speak louder? Sure. Um, art is one of the only places we have left to scream anymore. Uh, people go to the university to scream, and it becomes an incoherent dissertation. Uh, people go to the streets to scream, and we get arrested. Uh, people go home to scream, and it doesn't resonate beyond there. People go to the internet to scream, and we get dismissed as angry millennials. Or censored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I feel like um, what I love about theater uh, and why I think that we have really enjoyed moving into the theater world is that it's given us a space to actually just create a space, like a, I, I kind of think of it as like a watering well or sort of an oasis to just like be sad, angry, depressed, hurt, uh, frustrated. <laughs> All these parts of ourselves that I think get cleaved from us in order to survive in a world where we have to become desensitized in order to exist. And I think I would also add that I think a lot as, as a trans person, um, I'm already always on stage. Uh, when I walk out of my house, if I'm not performing the types of gender required in this heteropatriarchal system, then I'm told that I'm a faggot or a tranny and I should die. So I've learned from a very young age how to survive through performing. 
And what I found is that actually, ironically, the theater allows me to be myself in a way that nowhere else would. Mm -hmm. Because everywhere else, the rules are structured for me, where I have to wear pants or a suit or whatever, or whatever. But in theater, I can actually, in some ways, make people familiar with my strangeness through my ordinariness, which is like a very strange <laughs> equation. But I can actually tell a story about heartbreak or horniness or loneliness. And people are like, whoa, this person that looks so different from me is actually experiencing the same thing as me. And I'm like, oh. duh. Like, <laughs> like, we're out here not just like being some, I mean, I, I am an alien. I identify as such. But I also am an alien that experiences heartbreak and loneliness and sadness in a way that other humans might as well. So I think also what's interesting is that the destruction isn't just about like, blowing up, explosion. It's also just about the destruction of these arbitrary borders that have been imposed on us by this heteropatriarchal system, where actually only 4% of people know a trans person in their lives, which is like ridiculous to me. So but when they actually see our work, they're kind of like, whoa, trans people are just like everyone else. And I'm like, duh. So I think that that destruction is like the quiet sort of explosion. This is what I'm interested in theater too, is that it's not just about like setting fire to something, which I'm down to do, but it's also about the sort of like setting fire to all these socially constructed borders and identities and labels that we've created as a way to keep ourselves distanced from one another. I, I want to pick up on um, mm -hmm. word Because I saw, uh, this is uh, Guillermo Calderon, uh, and his piece, Escuela. Um, and um, it's very much about resistance, uh, political resistance in Chile. Um, and um, I kind of lost the thread of my question. Um, Maybe I can but, help. I wonder, yeah. like, you're in your next piece, you're, you're learning about how to be revolutionary. And so there's this building process that we're watching. Why that is your framing device for that piece, and is it related to this idea of destroying the world or creating a new one? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, the play is about a, a group of young people uh, getting up, sort of par paramilitary training during the late 80s in Chile in order to destroy the dictatorship. I'm using the word destroy. Oh. <laughs> Not only the dictatorship, but um, capitalism. So um, they fail, of course. So um, the play is about trying to destroy, but failing to destroy. So it's a play about failure of the possibility of destruction. And also, what comes out of that failure? Uh, theater. So um, theater is, uh, in many ways, um, I don't know, a, a, a way of acknowledging um, the failure of um, a true political change. So for us, we have a mixed feel feelings about the political theater. We, we feel the impulse of destruction, but then again, it happens uh, on stage and set of a beautiful theater. So it's a play about that composition. That makes me think about maybe flipping failure into failure. Like, what is and the way that you have them use their bodies, I feel like what we're seeing is we're seeing them trying something. Um, I don't know if that is how you experience it or if that affects your composition of that. I think that first, just to contradict you slightly, we also do work with professional yeah. and trained performers, though we are often asking them to strip away the habits or the skills or the vernacular that they've acquired from from a training so that it's getting to like a more unbehaved body, I guess, um, or unbehaved way of being in the room. Um, I think we're interested in vulnerability, which is a, I think a word that gets thrown around a lot. I think there's something about what a vulnerable, I think there's something about vulnerability on stage that recalibrates the experience for the audience and somehow can make them think about the event, think about what's happening here, 
think about why we're here, what being, what, what being a witness to this is. Um, so I think we are, we are generally trying to put some kind of vulnerability on stage so that, some, so that we can uh, raise the stakes, so that we can wake the audience up, so that they can think about what we're doing. Uh, so I think in terms of who we put on stage, uh, um, well, can you speak specifically about like working with these young uh, children and how that changes the conversation around vulnerability? Because children are more vulnerable in well, a lot of ways. I think on a mechanical level, I don't know if anyone has seen Employee of the Year, the show we're doing here. It's the, the people who are on stage are between, now they are between the ages of 11 and 12, and they each are performing a fairly complex, uh, intricate choreography while they each performer has about 15 minutes of a monologue. And, um, you know, the, the challenge of that has changed as we've been working with them for such a long period of time when they were nine years old. Like, getting through the whole thing was like, can, yeah. can they even do it? You know, it was like putting, giving these five girls the keys to the car and then saying, okay, go. <laughs> you can't reach the brakes. Um, <laughs> I think that, that that has changed now that they actually understand and have a, a deeper level of awareness of the story and the words that are coming out of their mouth, and so the vulnerability is less about the um, sort of apparatus of the show and like the, the like theatrical mechanism, uh, and more it's actually about, though th this is still present, I mean they're still small young people and they stand in front of stage, and on a stage in front of you know 200 people and sing and do all this stuff, which I couldn't do. <laughs> um, and uh, I think we are asking them to make contact in a way that pushes their level of comfort. But I think that now it's almost like inside of the storytelling in a way that it used to be when they were much younger. I think in crafting the art of our show, as in like what poems we're able to do first and then what poems we're able to do uh, in the middle of the show versus last, all these things, right? Um, I think there are sort of two calculations that go on. It's like, what do we want to perform? And then also, how do we make sure that this audience who is not used to seeing people like us having things to say um, and having you know, beautiful words with which to express them uh, say the thing? Right? If we're trying to like be heard, create uh, consistent moments of rupture and then opening and uh, whatever. It, it, I think of this as uh, it's kind of like cellular transformation, right? Your cells have to die in order for them to be replenished. And so I, I think of each sort of arc in our, uh, in our show as, as moments of uh, micro transformation that, are, that allow the next thing to happen. Um, so we start with uh, a lot of humor, like very queer tradition of campiness, um, because humor becomes this, like, th there is joy in resistance, right? And so humor becomes this way where uh, we're able to make people laugh in a really uncomfortable way, and then like shove truth in while that's happening. Um, and then <laughs> later on in our show, I think uh, there's more and more of our personal stories that get unwrapped. Um, and then the end of the show is like very solemn. Um, it's a little bit more universal, uh, right? Because people think universal things are things that are not explicitly about race and gender, um, even though those things are also universal. Um, and there, there is a sort of uh, resignedness, if that's a word, 
um, to the end of our show that uh, isn't giving you a happy ending, um, but maybe a, a true one. You know, um, I don't believe in people. I believe <laughs> that every person is a constellation of stories. And I find it very difficult that we exist in a world that tells us, like, oh, I know love. Oh my god, I know love too. They're great. It's like you both know fundamentally different people. Like I'm simultaneously a million people. Like, and it's just really ridiculous to me that we keep on pretending like we're individuals. It's like so funny. And um, <laughs> so for me, what really frustrates me is that we exist in a system that affords infinite complexity to white cisgender straight men and increasingly white gay men. So I go to cinema and I see another story about a white man in love with a white woman and another tortured love story about, I can't tell her, oh my god. And I'm like, honestly, honey, you have 600 years of cinema to look through to get advice. Like, <laughs> no. When I think about flirting, I'm like, wow, I could die if I flirted with this person. That's great. Um, and I just think about how, actually, I've seen every flavor of sadness that ever exists from white men. Like, there's sadness about losing your mom. So that every single thing has been explored. And I've been taught from a very young age to think, wow, people, uh, sorry, let me rephrase, because under the society, the only people allowed humanity are white men. White men are so tortured and complicated and wonderful and brilliant and exquisite. And then when we look at representations of my communities, <laughs> it's like we literally have to say, from the moment I was born, I knew I was a girl. And I touched a doll and I found myself and it was incredible. And from that moment, I was trapped in the wrong body. Then I went to a nice white doctor in a white coat, and I said, doctor, I've always wanted to wear a dress, and he allowed me to explore my own truth, and now I'm a happy, wonderful, full woman. <laughs> oh my god, no. We're not allowed to actually be like, hey, I kind of like cars too, and that doesn't in any way invalidate my gender, lol. Or like, hey, actually, I didn't need to have medical um, examination on my body in order to dictate the terms of which I live my life. Oh, so what I think what we're also trying to do in our show is show, hey, actually, these people who you've been taught unidimensional narratives about, immigrants, brown people, people who you perceive as Muslims, trans people, gender nonconforming people, sexual people, queer people, we're actually just as complicated as your boring white ass. And actually, <laughs> you're not gonna come to my, my show and hear some boring arc of like how it's been so hard for me and now I've overcome, because it's part of the same wanky liberal establishment where you're not actually allowing me infinite complexity. And I think the project of what I'm both trying to do as an activist and as an artist is to make people recognize that people are terribly complicated and that the state in particular relies on very traditional and boring narratives of oppressed people. That the reason we get away with supporting undocumented people, which we're doing more than we've ever done before in our entire lives, hundreds of thousands of undocumented people are being deported every single year. The reason that we get away with murdering black people with no impunity, incarcerating black people with no impunity, continuing the ongoing conquest of indigenous peoples is because the representation that we have of our communities is so basic that you literally do not think that we are human. And the way that we get to be seen as human is not actually through empathy, no. It's actually through complexity, which is a very different register. Because empathy is about, I understand you, and therefore I can categorize you and own you. Whereas complexity is about, I do not understand you, but I still affirm the fuck out of you. <laughs> and that's what I was taught to do for white men, and that's what I want to do for everyone, right? So I feel like for me, um, the reason that we make our show so contradictory, in one sense we're like saying, this is the politic. Like one sense we're saying, we hate white people. And the next sense, I love white people so much. And the next sense, it's like, I hate myself. And the next sense, it's like, I love myself. It's because the truth is we're all going through that process. I've never met a person who's so self-actualized where every single minute of the day they wake up and they're like, I have an assured sense of myself narrative. <laughs> <laughs> and I refuse to be contained because I think part of the way oppression works against my communities is at the level of narrativity, that we cannot actually be contradictory and paradoxical in our narrative. And I think that we lose so much in politics if we require oppressed people not only to experience violence, but then to narrate their violence in a way that is appetizing for other people. Boring. So I want to get narratives of violence that are actually contradictory and complex, and the way that we layer that in our show is we're literally taking you from like elation to like trauma to sadness to rage, because that's kind of like what it's like to live as a person, by the way. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
so much. Um, but, um, you know, that, that we're all millions of people that we, and that identity or personality or character is not fixed in a way. And I think actually every piece, every maker on the stage is, is actually negotiating that as a work in some way. Um, you know, I feel like the girls are always the girls. They're, they're, they, they tell the stories, they become the thing, but we're always very aware that they're young girls. And, and, and so there's this tension. <coughs> in Game of Your Year piece, we don't ever know their names, really. They tell their, their names of the year or their resistance names. Um, they're masked the whole time. Um, in a way, so, so um, I kind of wanted to ask, um, um, before I ask the other question, um, uh, how do you, do you think of them as, as like, how do you think of them, like, are they based on real people? Is it, is it an idea? Like, yes. are we supposed to all be able to sort of imagine ourselves as revolutionaries? No, they are not based on real people. Um, people are, um, during the whole play, they are masked. You don't see their faces uh, at all. So, um, that's because uh, they, they engage in political violence. So once you do that, you are sort of uh, tainted forever. You're not supposed to talk about that because that's uh, illegal everywhere. And also the, the mask, uh, to mask your face has a really sort of a strong, uh, iconic um, presence. Uh, I don't know, what's your right or, or black, black, Torture in Baghdad, or maybe um, ISIS. It, it's um, a very common thing. We, we are. Uh, it's um, also a very complex thing. But um, the way we use it, it's um, it's a way of uh, saying that um, basically we're all engaged in political violence, um, either actively or passively. So if you live in the U.S. and you pay taxes, you are paying for war. You are engaging. possible to call yourself a pacifist because you are basically um, engaging in everything that, ha that uh, I, I guess the U.S. is uh, doing. Uh, so um, the idea of hiding yourself is, uh, it means that you are doing something illegal so you might as well uh, hide it because you don't want to be sent to prison, but it's also it's a matter of hiding yourself because there's something shameful um, about engaging in violence. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's the that's the way we use it. Yeah. And it's interesting that um, there's sort of like uh, uh, a Loki, I'm sorry. Um, yours is all about not hiding. <coughs> it's like your work is about not hiding. And your work is about this particular piece is about hiding. But it's both in, in the service of resistance and Does unmask 
the idea uh, that clothing itself is a mask, right? Um, that regardless of what gender you're presenting as, who you are trying to be at a particular moment, um, everyone is uh, performing something. They're trying to be seen as something, um, whether consciously or unconsciously, um, whether purposefully or like without agency, right? Without the ability to actually uh, choose and purposefully craft that thing, um, or somewhere in the middle, which is where most of us are. Um, most of us don't have the ability to like completely choose the aesthetics that we have to fall into, right? Um, I think for us, uh, part of this aesthetic project um, is yes, about like, yes, everything, everybody is making these conscious and unconscious choices about who they are at a particular moment. Um, and it's like really ludicrous that transgender non-performing people are like spat on, <laughs> like kicked for uh, uh, particular choices that everyone is actually making. Um, but then on, honestly, I think it's like uh, another way of dismantling boring. Like, it, like I'm tired of, uh, I don't know, like living in a world that is not saturated with bright colors, um, where we've lost this sense of like playfulness and fun um, and being children, um, being weird. Uh, if there's like any sort of group of people that I really want to fight for, it's weirdos, um, like strange people um, who fortunately through touring get to meet all over the place in like really <laughs> unexpected places. We have like this internal list of weird people. Um, we also have an internal list of nice people. Um, because these, these are the kinds of things that I think, uh, you know, like we can talk about brown people, whatever, trans people, et cetera. Um, but I think there is this, there are these like categories that are outside of those identity frameworks um, that also get lost to the violences of the everyday world we live in. Um, one of them is strange people. Um, another one is babies. Um, because we are, are just told to like grow up and be professional. Um, interesting people, uh, nice people. Anyway, these are the people I'm fighting for to be tamed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Art of political fashion. Well, in case you didn't know, um, there's a genocide going on against trans women of color in this world. Every 32 hours on average, a trans woman is murdered. And that's a conservative estimate because when trans women are murdered, we're often misgendered in our deathbeds by our own families, by our own communities, and called men. Uh, and then on top of that, I identify as non-binary, which means I'm neither a man or a woman. So we don't actually know what violence against our communities look like because we're always already, our, our dead bodies are always hard to mark before we assign at birth. So I would actually say that it's probably even higher. And in 2015, there were almost uh, over 30 murders um, of trans people in this country. And when trans people are murdered, there's absolutely no news coverage. Uh, and the news coverage that does exist blames us for our own deaths and actually misgenders us and calls us whores and sluts and terrible people. Um, and that actually, there's no human outcry at all. <laughs> and we often say trans women aren't murdered, they're disappeared. And it's a very different politic when you have no one left to grieve your body. And so I think a lot about issues of murder, <laughs> a lot, because these are the communities that I'm fighting for and by. And almost every single one of my trans friends knows that feeling of walking down the street and thinking, does this man want to fuck me, kill me, or be me? And recognizing that these are all mutually informing systems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is negotiated through fashion. Because if I wake up and I say, today I'm gonna wear a dress, I have to prepare myself. <laughs> because the minute I step out of a house, I have to fight for the integrity of my life. I have to justify my ability to breathe. And I have, to, I have all of society's hatred of everything, not just femininity, but of everything thrown on me. And I have to literally just like sit here and be like, okay, this is your projection of your insecurity around your own gender, got it, great, cool. Just trying to live my life, just trying to drink a juice, uh, great. Um, but I have to deal with all of that. And I've been thinking a lot about that because it's a very different reaction when I'm on the stage. When I wear what I would normally wear, because everything I wear on the stage, we always joke, because you know, being an independent artist, we have to file uh, our own taxes, and so we can list costume wear as a tax deductible. But I'm always like, Jenny, I would wear all of this off the stage too. So I don't know, my life is costume wear, I guess. The yeah. trans privilege looks like yeah. being able to duck your really clothes as costume. Know, <laughs> costume. So I always think this is 
really weird for me because like online when I post a photo of myself or like at a show, it's like, you look amazing. And I'm like, do you realize that if I step two blocks away from the theater, people are gonna call me some very bad things. And I've learned how to run in these platform heels really because I have to. And I know how to take these shoes off really quickly because I might have to hack a bitch. But anyways, um, so like I think about that disconnect and what's actually happening there. And I actually think that the reason trans people are getting murdered is the same reason in which people congratulate for me for my fashion <laughs> and their mutually informing systems because you still think that we're performing as something that we're not. <laughs> and that the only way you can accept trans people is when we're on a stage because we're making literal what you already felt, which is what we're making literal is that the society, which is Western colonial society, hates femininity hates it so desperately that when we see someone who we read as, quote, a man who would dare wear, quote, women's clothing or, quote, women's makeup, that's disgusting. And what you're hating is not actually us, it's femininity. And the only way we've been taught to understand femininity is as theatrical and as performative and as excessive, which is a logic that facilitates the mass murder and atrocities of cisgender women as well. But the secret is cisgender women, rather than aligning themselves with trans people, say, oh, that's gross, because they've also internalized their own misogyny. So for me, I think it's really, what I'm trying to do with my fashion is make explicit people's misogyny. The reason you're uncomfortable seeing me, quote, with a beard, quote, looking like, quote, a man, quote, wearing, quote, women's clothing, quote, is because of your own internalized misogyny, darling, and that you've been taught from a very young age that femininity is weakness, and that's something you need to recalibrate in your life, because it's leading to your own repression of your divine femininity, which is making your sex life boring, which is making your relationships boring, and in making your fashion choices utterly drab. Work out of it. So that's what I'm trying to do with my fashion, is really confront people's misogyny and just survive. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things you talk about is the culture of violence in America, um, and, you know, we have a very violent culture here to each other, like, Americans often kill other Americans, mostly white Americans killing other white Americans. The nature of systemic <laughs> government violence against the citizenry of America is quite different. It's not, it's much more quiet, um, and it's certainly not explicit, and this is why, so I want to ask, having watched and there, I'm not going to say that there's, there's, if you see Escuela, there's a moment where we know that you experience this systemic repression under uh, your dictatorship, um, personally. Um, I guess my one question is how, how does, I mean, this comes from your experience. So I guess my first question is like, and you talked about the failure of resistance, like how does making this work How, what is, how is that part of your making, reconciling with the failure of that, and of, of the revolution? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, you know, can we, as Americans, like, do you think we can actually get it? <laughs> do you think we can actually understand and experience your piece and really get inside it? Um, or do you think that the difference, because you have never experienced that in that way, is, is too far? Uh, uh, good question. Um, so sometimes uh, you read that you write a play or you direct a play only to say one sentence. Mm -hmm. So um, then I, uh, when I, when I sort of see my own work, I realize that in this in this play there's a, a sentence that says um, that our armed forces are cowards and traitors, and um, and that's great. That's me, that makes me feel. <laughs> because it's said in a in a little anger, so it's, I think that this play is sort of um, it's just a platform for expressing anger and frustration. So um, and that's um, uh, it doesn't cure me of anger; it just sort of uh, recycles anger and sends it into the into a into a new stage. And um, I think uh, when I present the play here. Um, it's wonderful, people really connect, and the, because they are uh, really uh, sort of uh, generous in making connections with the current violence all over the world. But I think there's a, uh, uh, there's the experience of uh, living under a dictatorship that is pretty unique, uh, people who have, have experienced
proof that really can connect to that. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of, um, if I can explain it briefly, is basically having um, someone, I don't know, I don't know, something like China financing uh, a coup, uh, making alliance with a sector of the armed forces in, in, um, in the US, um, bombing the White House and killing Obama and tens of, of thousands of people and, and uh, basically um, um, closing the, con uh, the Congress and, and taking over the country and then staying in power for uh, more than 15 years. So what would that do to the country? So that's what happened in my country. So that, as I describe it, uh, as in the concept of the US, sort of explains a little bit of what the, the impact mm -hmm. on the sort of the core of the country is, the soul of the country, if you can, if you can uh, say that sentence. Mm -hmm. So that's my thesis. So that's what theater is trying to deal with in, uh, now, basically. So that experience, I think uh, people in the US cannot completely relate to on an emotional level, but definitely in an intellectual level. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely it's, uh, it's completely satisfying with the way people uh, uh, understand the play. Mm -hmm. the work. Yeah. And I just, uh, I, I think the scenario you described, I think you could sell that to Hollywood. It's not a great film. Um, I mean, honestly, we were, we were, we were in, it's, we were inspired by a girl we saw in a movie, and it was as easy as that. And we saw the movie, and we thought, let's do that. <laughs> when we were testing out the idea, I think it was sort of like really trying to. We were writing the play at the same time, and we were working with different actors and performers of various ages and genders, and um, and we. Um, I think it was we were sort of trying to concoct the, the scenario and like who should who should be the messenger of the story and who should we see on stage and who should um, who whose truth sort of brings a layer of complexity to the story that we're telling and bends it and shifts it into a more complex way than we can do just by putting the story out there alone. Um, like who's the right person to tell the story and who's the wrong person to tell the story. And usually there's something more interesting in the wrong person. Um, and so um, I think the, the idea that as, this, as the narrative moves forward in time and it's the story of one woman's life um, and that as she ages that it diverges from the performers so that, that you know that these people are telling you about experiences that they have not had um, so that there is a sort of widening of the gap between the character on a theater, theatrical level and the performer on a real human level. Um, Actually, I think the hope is there that in the widening of the gap, there's actually a, um, a contradiction that happens that because of the amount of time, because of their con command of the room, because they are very powerful presences, um, and also because of the sort of seduction of a theatrical story, that um, you actually come deeper in, you, the widening of the gap actually is a closing, that you actually get closer into the story. You
inception of the piece was that it was like a lifetime inspiration. We do, we do have a, a card out here at once, so I do want to open it up to the But we also know that a lot of people who are coming to see these performances and volunteering to experience that, that there may be some preaching to the choir, or there may be some speaking often to a community that already empathizes or understands. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how either that theatrical experience echoes beyond itself, or how you choose to act both in the world and in your work to be destroying and recreating in the world and not just in the theater. I'll be very explicit. Um, I'm here to recruit. Every time I speak, every time I act, every time I dress, every time I think, I'm talking about the struggle of my people, period. There's never an apolitical moment for me because there's a type of urgency of which one your friends are dying and you have to fight like hell for them, right? And for me, I realized from a very young age that people are much more likely to pay me and listen to me if I say what I'm doing is art versus if I say what I'm doing is activism. Because we live in a culture that hates activists even though activists have created the conditions with which all of us are living in. <laughs> there would be no such thing as theater. There would be no funding for arts if it wasn't for people screaming historically saying this is important, right? And so what I think about with what we're trying to do is we actually have a, an organizing strategy and philosophy. So we think how do we bring in people into the room who wouldn't normally be there? We have a really sexy social media presence. We are constantly thinking about ways to bring in people through really neoliberal, neoliberal things like our fashion, our selfies, like some like liberal love narrative, whatever. Whatever brings people in. And then the, the first thing you learn when you're a social movement organizer is you do base building. So we build that base online. Then we do political education. So we teach them about the issues we're experiencing. And then we give them opportunities. So we say, come to our show. The show sells out, great, phenomenal. Now we bring them into the room, and we think, how do we fundamentally destroy this person's entire universe? Where they're not just going to do this white cis liberal thing where they come and see us and they're like, wow, diversity. I learned a new experience today. I'm going to go home and tell my children, wow. But actually going to be like, I feel deeply implicated, and I'm going to actually support. So then we do that in our art, and then we say, follow us on social media. We bring them in, and then we present them new opportunities to go and support other artists, activists, jump into other campaigns, actually support different issues, recalibrate their politics, right? So for me, I think one of my biggest critiques of the theater world is that it sees the job as ending when the show is over, and that's just when it began, darling. What's your follow-up? How are we gonna bring them in? How are we gonna actually build with these people? How are we gonna get people to understand these concepts? Because people don't learn in a two-hour span, they just don't. They learn over lifetime. So that's why I think we always need to be thinking about how does theater and how does art fit, fit within a bigger strategy of what we're trying to do? And I hear a lot of people say these really nasty things about young people all the time, like, oh, young people's attention spans are so small and they can't enjoy theater, or, oh, the turn towards digital has made it so people just don't want to go in there and experience. No, it's because your work is boring. And it's because it's irrelevant. And actually, young people are now discerning enough to recognize, I'd rather watch Netflix because they're actually giving me things that actually interest me than going to go see dead white old men make really boring theater at the public, right? So for me, it's really about <laughs> recognizing that it's not enough to just be like, ha, 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 my theater is amazing, but actually make it relevant and make it accessible and make it actually relate to the people who need to be in the room, not the people who are already coming. Um, I think to add to that, I mean, this one question I've been trying to grapple with is a question of belief uh, and how regardless of who we are, right, to some extent we've been influenced by this culture that tells us to individualize grief or put it in particular receptacles. And so much of what has uh, happened, um, and, and this is relevant to what I promise, but the, so much of what, ha of what we have experienced, right, whether it's the ongoing Well, whether it's like uh, now this thing called the war on terror that uh, we justify by saying we're sad, therefore we're going to bomb everyone, um, right? I think there is this sense that people don't know how to grieve in ways that are broad and empathetic 
um, and lovely um, and like hold that pain and instead they put that pain in things like marriage, uh, war, deportation, prisons. I think it does become this sort of cyclical thing to the spiritual fabric of who we are when the only uh, ways we can think of dealing with things that are uncomfortable uh, is by incarcerating them, uh, deporting them, uh, bombing them, right? And I think to a certain extent that's what we've done in, a, in the realm of culture as well. Um, and, the, and that reinforces all these other systems, right? Um, again, what a was saying about how if we have these flat representations of people, uh, then it is okay to call them terrorists. Um, if we have these flat representations of people, um, then they're, they are illegal, right? Um, so I, I, I don't think it's, I, when, I wanna, when I say I wanna make spaces for people to grieve, uh, I mean I want them to be able to grieve for unmarked bodies um, and for systemic violence and for like all of history all the time, um, and in, in, anyway, anyway um, to your question, I I don't actually think that most of the audiences like at the public are uh, generally used to going through like police custody. Um, I don't think that much of our work is initially intelligible uh, to a lot of the people we perform for, not just here, like all over the place, um, and that's part of the beauty of it. I don't want to agree with everyone I perform for. Um, I want them to challenge me. I wish I could say that I was preaching to the choir, but the choir we would be preaching to is so small. <laughs> um, like, so small. There, there are not that many, like, non-binary, like, anti-colonial activists out there. Uh, for us, for us, like, populate a show with them, um, we would never make money. But if like, they even have a great theater space where we could do that. <laughs> so, like, let us know. We would totally do If you want to pay for their tickets, free. like, feel free. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about theater's role in not just deconstructing or storytelling or destroying the current world, but actually ways that you're seeing, and I love the point of theater doesn't end off the stage, but it's actually connecting to education and access to opportunities, but where you guys are seeing examples of theater that's actually proposing a vision for a new world, so instead of tearing down the current world that we have, who's being really effective and actually visioning things for people so that this isn't to be inspired by theater and then go out and create your own world, but to actually see a proposal for a new world that's being created. Uh, I just wonder if that's happening. I haven't seen it. I don't know if any of you have. interested in boredom in a way, but I don't know how to defend that quite. I think it's because it's just our own. Well, I, I mean, I think it's interesting that yeah. Shani brought up boredom as like something to fight against, and I do think that our fascination with it is a bit of a fight in its own way. Um, the changing a time signature with which you are, if you can change the time signature of a group of people with which you're experiencing the passing of time, then we can reframe a theatrical event. The, the lifting of an arm or a simple act of intimacy between two people is all of a sudden can be perhaps more, there's like a magnitude uh, to a, perhaps something that might have been un, unremarkable in like a you know YouTube attention span. I mean, there's so much that's, that's huge. I, you know, I have my now notes of like, I would love to actually we don't have the time to dig into boredom <laughs> much more, is because I boredom is fascinating. Um, but um, I, I, picking up on like on grief and and boredom and all these, I just want to <coughs> ask actually, um, and your question about uh, envisioning other worlds, and I think the 
behind the title destroyer of worlds is the idea of destroying what exists to create new ones. In 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 Escuela, um, they're very clearly articulating a, a vision of a sort of post-capitalist Marxist utopia that they want to achieve. We know, because we're watching the play, that they fail. Um, it seems that there is, my, my experience the play was that there is grief about that. Um, how, I guess, as the playwright, and sort of, do you feel that they, um, or as an individual, do you still feel that the impulse to try and create a sort of utopian, better world is, is, a, is an important one? Yes, definitely. Um, of course, I, I use the word pessimism, but there's also um, idealism, um, hidden, I guess, under the layers. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, maybe um, capitalism is going to destroy the planet, and uh, something new is going to um, arise from that. So, uh, and that new thing, it better uh, be better than this one. And that's going to motivate us for a long time now, at least for the rest of our lifetime. So um, I think um, now we, we live in a sense of a, in the middle of a big crisis, a crisis that's, go, that's just going to keep going. And I think uh, we're going to need to sort of uh, gather all the ideas in order to create something new as soon as we can. So uh, and I think that's uh, what uh, one of the things that theater is now uh, uh, I think that's a great place to end, which is to gather all the idealists. I see we've got a bunch on the stage and we're doing that. Eve, everybody thank Eve,